Welcome to Muscle and Money, the podcast for gym owners aiming to elevate their business. I'm your host, Andres Fiovic. Join us as we explore top strategies of the fitness entrepreneurs, uncovering the blueprints of their achievements and offering actionable advice to increase revenue, boost retention rate and expand your locations. Whether you're just starting out or scaling your operations, Muscle and Money is your go-to resource. Let's build stronger businesses one episode at a time. Welcome, everybody. Today, I'm excited. I'm thrilled about having Helene Knapp. She's a founder and CEO of City Row. This is the fitness phenomenon that focuses on smart fitnesses for the modern customers. And she's delivering truly omnichannel customer experience. 10 years in the business, even more. Started 2014 with a rowing workouts and total body sculpting exercises, focusing really, really awesome niche about pain-free exercises, right? Yeah. This is what, what makes it work. And uh, now recently, she spent time coaching. She learned a lot and she's willing to s- share her knowledge and she loves to coach, advise, and consult founders, growth companies. So welcome to the show. We're, we are pleasure to, to very, have you here. Very happy to be here. Thanks again for having me. So... What we want to do today is we want to help people who are walking the path. Somebody is just starting their own entrepreneurship journey. Somebody is halfway thinking, are they going to grow or not? Somebody is at a peak and thinking like, oh, should I exit or should I not? We want to help them out. I would love to hear from you in short two to five minutes about your journey. Where are you now? Where you been? And, and more importantly, why did you do it? What was the reason behind it? Yeah. Well, one, I appreciate the opportunity to tell my story and hopefully share some nuggets that can help people as they're figuring out what to do and where they're at and if they want to jump in or not. So I'll back up a little bit. Um, I, I'm a New Yorker through and through, and I'm probably one of those type A New Yorkers that is probably <laughs> a little bit part of a stereotype. I'm not afraid. I started my career, I worked at Condé Nast for a little while in magazine publishing, and then really had a love for technology and innovation and found myself really gravitating towards um, startups. And so luckily I got a job at a tech company. We helped brands understand social media. It was a super cool time to be an advertising world where things were changing. And so I got to see innovation, feel entrepreneurship, watch companies grow. I did another startup in the tech space. And personally, I, as a consumer, was falling in love with boutique fitness. And I am your basic consumer. Like mm-hmm. I am not a fitness professional. I never have been. In fact, I was like a much chubbier kid growing up that got cut from the sports teams. And so me falling in love with boutique fitness was because I loved making it a social event. I loved going with mm-hmm. friends. And for me, someone who was trying to prioritize health and wellness in my own life, I mm-hmm. loved the idea of, instead of getting a burger and a beer with friends, going to a spin class and then getting some sushi. That was a dream scenario <laughs> for me on a Tuesday night I, or a Friday night, you know, like it there was you a go. good time. So what you need to know is that I'm the consumer. And so I was taking all these crazy boutique fitness classes and I loved it, loved it. And unfortunately I found myself with a really bad injury that sidelined me from all of these workouts that I loved. And what the doctor said was, you need to find a low impact workout. All these high impact workouts aren't working for you. Mm. And so I was really pissed off. Andre. Like I was pissed because I'm actually a very conscientious person. Like I always do my homework Ooh, kind of a thing. Yeah. And so I and was I'm like, an energy I- addict. I need to have it. And doctor says you can't have it. It's like, where do I get my, my fix? I need, I need fix. my fix. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm seven days out, 5 30 yeah. more. And so I was like, well, there's got to be a better way. I was like, I'm very confused. So it was from that confusion and frustration and actually anger that I looked at what was out there. And I thought, if this is actually hurting me, why isn't there a way that I can go and get this amazing workout and energy and feel the community and work out with people and make it social that when you like actually peel back the intentionality of the movement and the programming, it's really, really, really good for you. Mm -hmm. And I did way too much research. I played a little bit too much into the world of trying to understand kind of fitness modality and learned very quickly that there were only three total body workouts out there that were Mm -hmm. also low impact. Swimming, 
Yes, which, I was about to say. We can so. all talk about how great swimming is, but I'm going to tell you, Andre, my hair does not look like this when I get out of the shower. So I'm <laughs> to cross country skiing, not not mm. super accessible. Although the skier, I cool. wouldn't put that on the list. Yeah, and then and then rowing, which you know, ten years ago, eleven sure. years ago, when I had this concept, it was very crossfitty. It was very Winklevoss twenty, right? Let's leave mm -hmm. it at that. But I realized that it was a really this unsung hero of the gym, and it's mm. just in my mind it needed a makeover to mm -hmm. be made front and center, accessible and mainstream for mm -hmm. consumers and particularly for women. And so I I saw this idea and wow. I'm one of those people that actually executes on an idea, Andre. So Whoa. I was like, let's make rowing mainstream. That was my idea. Can I hold you there for a second? So what people are not seeing here, and maybe you know, is your greatest pain becomes your biggest gift, blessing. Like if you have not experience that pain if you've never been injured like you would never think about hey how do i research and find a solution and that solution right. becomes a solution for so many people they are blessed to, to to follow the path so when somebody thinking like oh i'm pissed about this just turn around a little bit and says hey how can i follow helene's steps and think make the opportunity out of this uh, absolutely and i think cool. i mean that's so hard to hear in the moment Yes, it is. <laughs> I would have said, get out of here, Andre. You know, and I think a lot of people can see that in hindsight and you can try and think about it in the moment, but it really is something you can only reflect on after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I have a friend, right? And like this goes for anybody in any industry and whatever you're doing who, and you know, I'll get back to the story in a second, who was laid off and she hated the job. And I, when I, when I spoke to her afterwards, I was like, you know, I'm sorry and congratulations. You know, it's one it's one of those things where it's like, and she could, she was awesome. She was able to like kind of get there and see it faster than I think most people, and then start to embrace it and realize this there is the best thing that fucking happened to her. There and we so go. That's where I hope people can get to is you know not not experiencing the pain or the sadness or the disappointment, but to move through a little bit faster, knowing cool. that it's probably going to set you off in a direction that you needed to go in. So. Yes, and sometimes we need that discomfort zone, that saying never again. Somebody yeah. has to push us out over the edge because otherwise we we can find ourselves so much comfortable in a place, and there's so much more out there. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we're not going to get to the end of the city row story just yet because I'll, I'll give everything away. But so quickly on how we decided to build it, realize rowing was actually really, really, really hard. That people shouldn't row for an hour, so it couldn't mm -hmm. be like a class. But that it was perfectly paired with strength training work, and mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time looking at the macro industry in fitness and wellness. And I talk a lot about what I call the fitness maturity curve. And mm. I have a great slide on this. I'll send it to you after. But basically, you know, it talks about how people move through their their fitness journey in life. Okay. And you, you, I'll just, I'll, I'll break the news to you. You and I are at the bottom. You got to send me that. We can't forget. Yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's good stuff. But at the top of the funnel, it's people that are just beginning their journey. And they might mm -hmm. start walking, which is amazing. They're going to try and get their steps in. Maybe they'll join the local YMCA. Maybe they're going to like expand into like anytime fitness, maybe it curves. They're going to start to, and then, and then about midway down when they start to decide that they want to dedicate more mm -hmm. of their time and more of their wallet to fitness and wellness, then they might enter boutique fitness. There so we boutique go. fitness is right in the middle, right? There we go. And then as you progress further and further, you start to get to personal training, you start to get to at-home gyms, you start to get to mm -hmm. wearables, you start to get to people that are fucking crazy and going into ice baths. Yeah, exactly. You're wearing 15 wearables right now. I got one on. It's enough for me. So anyway, I'm, that's how I think about the fitness ecosystem. And it really is a funnel. And people need to move through that fitness maturity level in their own way. And I'm happy to talk about mm -hmm. what COVID did to that in a later, a later stage, but sure. i saw a lot of opportunity because as people are moving through this, they're also working out for not just more days of the week, right? When I was younger, mm -hmm. it was I want to get a workout in. Now it's okay. I'm going to move every day. How do I be more intentional about that? So if we are mm -hmm. going to be our bodies for more days of the week and more years of our lives, right? Kids are getting started earlier. My grandmother's 88. She, tra she trains twice a week. Yeah, she's looking great. You know, she's standard and the expectations she's are moving, totally she's, changing. She's, in a, she's sitting in a chair. She's sitting yep. in a chair for most of the workout, but she's wearing workout gear and there is a one pound weight. And let me tell you how proud I am for every single time I see her on her Zoom with her. Yeah, setting up different standards. 
regularly. <laughs> I talk to Tracy all the time to make sure we're actually doing something. But all to say is that that means many more hours and weeks that we're putting pressure on our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot pound the pavement in our 20s and 30s and expect to have knees when we're in our 80s. And mm. so really, really like intrinsic need that I had, mm. I would like to be like an angry grandma on a tennis court. Like I'm a big mm. tennis player and I want to just like, I want to be there when I'm in my eighties and I want to be hustling hard. So that means I have to be more intentional about movement now. And this is a macro trend. And so I literally tell that to myself, I want to do it hundred what I'm doing that today, you know, but it's today when you start to take care of it. So it lasts. Right. We only have one set of knees. I mean, I'm sure we can replace them if we want to, but probably <laughs> not, or at least put it off a little bit longer. Right. And so all to say is that I saw this huge opportunity to bring something to the space that was going to be really intelligently designed, a balance of cardio and strength training that also incorporated mobility and core work, and that everything was just really smartly designed to interface together. And mm. that was how the idea of City Row came to be. Um, and then I had to start the company, which was a whole different <laughs> Because the idea does not come to life on its own, right? No. How many times did you share an idea with, some, uh, with somebody before you took it on your own? Oh, man. It was boiling for some time, right? About a year of maturing yeah. the idea. I always tell an early entrepreneur, like, what are the three to five things that have to be true mm -hmm. for you to say yes and for you to jump in? And I, mm. I literally was, I was talking to a very seasoned entrepreneur the other day. And I was like, I was like, Joel, what are the five things that you need to prove to be true? What's your checklist? Yeah. Before you jump in, because there's always a little bit of internal fear, but that also yes. gives you an actionable list of things to do. And when you're starting a company, it feels very overwhelming, right? It's like, oh my God, I'm going to start a company. No, you got to make like four decisions at a time, right? Maybe one decision at a time to move the company forward. And so you really need to break this down into small chunks. For me, my small chunks were, one, how do I assess demand for this thing? Mm. How do I, I don't want to do it? How do I find space in New York City? Yes. And how do I find someone to teach the classes? Those were my <laughs> three buckets. And then I knew from there, okay, I've got to raise money and figure out other things, but I'm not going to worry about marketing now. I'm not going to worry about like, you know, managing a team. I have to focus on these three non-negotiables first. And mm -hmm. so I threw up a website to assess demand. And I said, sign up here for the next big thing in group fitness. And I just shared it across all my channels and had all my friends share it across their channels. And, yes. you know, fortunately we're pretty tapped into the space. And so we got picked up by Well and Good, which was such a big publication Whoa. at the time. And like the New York Daily News, like because fitness is really because common. it's new. Nobody was doing that. This is before. So you're starting a category, totally new category. Totally. New you don't category. have competition, but you don't have a market. You don't have demand. So you got to create demand as well. Yes, but luckily there was a lot of demand in this in the industry. And if you talk Correct. about this, is pre class pass and pain. So there was more demand than there was supply. Mm -hmm. Interesting question for you is: See, you could just open one store and be happy, but why? What? It gives you drive, that hunger to say, hey, one is not enough. Let's continue growing this. Oh, I feel like we're going to have to bring my therapist in for that conversation, Andre. <laughs> the deep. Um, I, I mean, I have a tremendous amount of ambition. And mm -hmm. after, I think, it, honestly, a lot of it comes from watching people build things. And also, there is this like deep internal drive to bring something to the market that's actually going to help people. And when I mm -hmm. see people who probably shouldn't be running on a treadmill at a 12 or mm. really shouldn't be doing push-up on a medicine ball. Like that mm. makes me angry because I've been mm. injured. I don't want you to be injured. And mm. so I really, really, really wanted to be able to expose as many people as possible to a better and smarter way to move your body. And so it was a combination of like ambition as somebody that likes to build things and go for it and shoot mm. for the moon. And also that was exacerbated and fueled by this like deep internal drive for myself and also my two co-founders to really introduce this and welcome more people into seeing that there's a better way to move their body. Mm -hmm. 
super cool super cool and i'm thinking it takes dedication first desire drive or willingness to go through day and night and failures and frustrations because there's a lot of people majority of the of the owners are now on one location and and it's fear to tap into second one and when you go to 10 what will i will you continue like how much is it enough but you did mention your own success is like making more money it's like oh there's a lot more people needed to be helped there so if you focus on somebody else instead of yourself it's a different game and that requires a lot of creativity. So what I love about what I do is I help gym owners become really great in what they do, delivering this value, exercise, workouts, health, and wellness to, to their own clients. But most of them requires two skills. One is how do I provide service? Second one is how do I bring more members? And that bringing more members is always a challenge. So there are two kinds of people. Once they are happy to jump in and learn from and do it themselves and others who can recognize good vendors to help them partner up and take that out from their hands. What was your recommendation? If you're starting over, would you find a partner to be part of that and hand over the marketing or would you learn it yourself? It's a very individual question. So mm. one, of the, one of the the concepts that I, I work a lot on in my coaching is, is self-awareness. So you have to first and foremost know yourself and your own strengths. Mm -hmm. More importantly, know your own weaknesses so that you can plug those holes. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like I know that I am a very good driver. I am the mm -hmm. best driver I know. I mm -hmm. can also probably talk my way out of anything or into anything as needed as my co-founder will tell you when. <laughs> need to go be put in to fix something, but I'm not good at many other things. And so when mm -hmm. I was looking for, you know, people or vendors or partners or whatever it is, it has to be very intentional around what am I not an expert in and where mm -hmm. do we need to bring an expert in? And so for me, mm -hmm. as a, when I was looking for a partner in the business, I needed a yin yang, someone that was very creative, a little bit more methodical, a little bit more thoughtful to balance out my drive, right? And so mm -hmm. when it comes, comes to like also finding the right vendors and partners, you have to take a little bit of analysis of your business, just like you would of yourself. And it's really important to know where the holes are. So I always like to hire the best oh, possible aware. person for the role. And if mm -hmm. that's an incredible vendor, let's hire them, let's outsource this. As long as we have the right infrastructure in place to support that, mm -hmm. make sure that it is the right partner. Like all day, every day. I do not believe in hiring people just to add people to your org, particularly yeah. these days. I also like, I partner with, I invest in, I consult, I do fractional COO, work with a lot of companies. So many people can drive like really, really lean businesses using technology. Mm -hmm. and yes, especially thing. today with the automation and AI and everything that's coming up. Yeah, like I, I work with a company that's two people, but they've done such a good job layering in a consultant here, a piece of technology there, a vendor here that also like reduces risk, right? Like yes. so many of the problems that I deal with with my coaching clients are people problems. So many interpersonal issues, right? People are hard to manage. Mm -hmm. If you don't need them, might as well find somebody for a fraction of the cost. And yeah, maybe you have to spend time dedicating to managing the vendor, right? And investing mm. in learning the vendor or the consultant, but it's a puzzle piece that you can move around a lot faster. And one of the powers of being a startup is being able to move fast and be nimble. And mm. what I found is that most startups can be faster and move if they have a agile with the right external resources. Love what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from you. And you just said it at the beginning of this conversation, how you got picked up by the media. It seems like you prefer that warm audience, a community building, a relationship that you have to grow the business. So would you touch on like, how do you build a community? How do you make that relationship between you and franchisees or between franchise or franchisee and their members to the next level? Like, how do you make that to be a really feeling of community because you are as a customer felt first part of a community and that's what attracted you. But how do you transfer that to somebody else? Yeah. I mean, two, two very different ecosystems. I think as a franchisor, it was really, honestly, it was fun to build our okay. franchisee relationships. That was one of the greatest things I'll take away from the entire journey mm -hmm. was getting to meet our franchisees and figuring out how to support them. And even after almost all of our franchises are closed post COVID, like I still talk to some of these people and they'll probably be in my life forever. If I go to visit a That's city, awesome. I'll always reach out to them. It's a very real and authentic relationship mm -hmm. because 
you've really both bet on each other. And that mm -hmm. was one of the first things I learned in franchising that really attracted me to it when I didn't know a whole lot about franchising before I got into franchising. I only had the experience of growing up and knowing of like a Subway and a McDonald's. And I was like, well, not my fancy boutique fitness <laughs> studio in New York, but I met some incredible people that helped educate mm -hmm. me as to what actually goes on behind the scenes. And I got very, very empowered and excited because when you meet people that share that intrinsic drive that I had, mm -hmm. that they also wanted to share an amazing modality for their own reason. And most of them had personal stories. We actually, we had a, a deep emotional connection day one. And so that was really easy and really, and really fun. And then it was like, okay, well, I'm betting on you to go and extend my brand. I mm -hmm. believe that you are going to be a good representative of my brand, right? That's mm -hmm. a huge risk that we're taking. And then they're also taking a risk on us saying, okay, these are the right assets. This is the right build. I'm going to spend my money on this and turn my 401k into this, right? It is really mm -hmm. like, you're basically getting married to these people right there away. There you go. So that was like a really deep relationship. And then it was just like, okay, well, how do we know what they need? How do we support them? And you talk about bringing in the right partner. I brought in a franchising partner because I'm also mm -hmm. the first to tell you that I wasn't a franchising expert six, seven years ago. And so mm -hmm. I needed to find that partner. I needed them to tell me how to do this perfectly and well. Wow. So for those people who are looking to, to extend, what I'm hearing is, listen, you can't do everything yourself. Recognize your weaknesses in any way or, or shape or form and rely on people. You got to trust them and you got to empower people to, to make ordinary people perform at, a, at an extraordinary level. And it starts with a trust. And I, it seems like you, you do have trust in your people. That's incredible. And today is in this world that we are so shallow in the conversations and the meaning and, uh, and even with the vendors, seems like you, a lot of times when I talk to a big franchisors, when it exceeds 200 locations, there's absolutely huge disconnect between franchisor and franchisees. It's almost like internal war. My goal is just to grow the number of licenses versus your goal is to grow your business. And there's a conflict, a little bit of interest. How do you keep that as you grow? How do you make sure that both sides are happy and, and growing? That's always a challenge. But when it comes to member community, any advice there for us and for people who are watching? Like, How do you make that fun atmosphere? How do you, not only when you're there, but how do you create process that can be replicated? Oh man, like hopefully your SOPs are, are really strong on the on the process. <laughs> but this really comes down to like, and this is this was like this is the hardest part. I'm gonna be super honest. Yes. Like the hardest part is hiring people in that local store and hiring mm. a middle manager to run three stores. Like this is the hardest thing. I think my advice is spend more time on it than you want to. Ooh. Beginning. Mm. Like over index here and overspend a little if you have to and try and bring them in, right? Mm. This person is often going to be working alone. So they need to have the right skill set for this. Mm -hmm. And ideally there's someone who is motivated by not just community, but also by hopefully some finances. I love to incentivize my managers with a little mm -hmm. bit of upside on the unit. And so mm. bring them in, have them be a part of the PL conversation, mm. have them kind of really build into that ownership and give them a piece of the upside, right? Like show them how long it's going to take for payback, incentivize them to help you get there faster, right? So their hard work become their rewards, not only yours. If they're the right person for that type of structure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then here's the thing, like I always talk about the magic that we felt in our first location. I felt it. Mm. I felt it when people came out of class and I was working the front desk and the things that they would say to me and the conversations we'd have. And it was a tiny little studio on the 15th floor of an office building and there were no bathrooms. Mm. Mm. You know, like it was, it was just tiny and it was magical because we all wanted to be there. Mm. And I so think it all comes down to the experience in the room. How do you know which studio works? Is there anything that you did in your SOPs to measure that community impact? Like, how do you measure success of your location, your own business or, or businesses that are under your umbrella? I mean, it all comes back to a healthy P&L. But like referrals but, are obviously a great sign of community that's building. The best clients are always going to be referrals from your current mm. And so it's a really healthy sign of how much they're enjoying their experience by how many people are coming in via referral. And Got it. 
So it all comes bit down to like, does the product work? Mm. Right? Like they also like the product has to work for you to get referrals. Does it match the community? Does it match what the community wants? And sometimes it doesn't. And that's what's like kind of crazy. Is, does it work? I think it works. Also square peg round, round hole isn't going to work. Mm. I, don't, I don't care how great you are. Great instructors help, great music helps, particularly in these day and age when I would say supply outpaces demand. Because referral is one of the coolest ways. I love it because my company is building referrals. The name is Referizer. We energize businesses to get more referrals. But I also know that the same strategy, same promotional material, same incentive works in some businesses better than others. Some businesses don't get no referrals. Will get no referrals just because their culture inside doesn't feel like, oh, I don't feel like empowering or or supporting this business. It's good for me, but I'm not sure if I'm going to bring my neighbor, brother, sister, colleague, and so on in it. Mm, that's interesting. interesting. Our, our, ours are very community driven. And so, you know, unless it's somebody who just like wants to work out alone, like, why aren't you bringing mm. your bestie with you? I don't know. But mm. I can understand that like a different type of business, a different type of consumer can totally, you know, require a different set of skills. And that's where, again, it comes down to self-awareness for yep. you, for your business, for your clients and for your community. And it's like, okay, well, what, what do we have? What don't we have? What does the puzzle look like? And how do we solve for what's missing? Tell me, Helene, what is the now your biggest focus at this time? You went through those, so many journeys. What's your next big passionate project? Um, well, I, I have a book coming out. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. It's called, it's called Making Waves. It is... I started writing it during the pandemic when things were going super crazy. Oh. And we also have a pretty big digital business, which experienced a very, 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 very different wave than our brick and mortar franchise studios. And so I wanted to tell the story of what really happens behind the scenes. It's not a right. rainbow and butterflies story, but it's still a very inspirational story. And so um, that comes out June 18th. I'm really excited about it. You can pre-order it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I'll make sure the links are available. And then I spend a lot of my time coaching, uh, coaching, consulting, advising. I love getting, I love getting in with founders and helping them through whatever challenges they're dealing with. And mm -hmm. it brings me, it, it brings me a lot of joy, industry agnostic these days. So a little bit of fitness, a lot of not fitness, and mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see how I can be impactful in this kind of next wave of entrepreneurs. I love it. So for you guys who are listening, she is here and available and we'll post some links to how to contact Helene about getting access to her or you should all buy the book or pre-order it. I, I will definitely do it now. So I love it, Helene. This is awesome. I have a couple fast questions. It's a one sentence answer, like a rapid questions. We'll go through a couple of them. Are you ready? I'm ready. Awesome. So who do you follow in the industry? Who do you like to... Uh, Listen, podcast, influencers, coach, person. Yeah, Where so you... I'm a big fan of our technology partner. His name is Muhammad Iqbal, and he runs a company called Sweatworks. I follow him on LinkedIn. He has amazing industry insights. He's reacting really quickly to what's going on. So I'm always paying attention to what Mo is doing when it comes to the fitness industry. And then outside of it, like I'm really big in, in personal growth. So you'll find me following... Mm -hmm. The Adam Grants of the world, the Simon Sinek's mm. of the world, the Brene Browns of the world. Those are the people that kind of stop me in my tracks and get me to think. That's awesome. So name two people you would like to recommend for this podcast. Somebody, you know, it has a skills that you would like us to interview and bring them on and ex extract the knowledge for you. Yeah, I have a really good friend that runs a massage franchise concept. Her name is Brittany Driscoll. And mm. she, I've never seen somebody, she's a former, you know, CMO of Dry Bar who launched mm. a new massage concept. And I've been friends with her for a very long time and watching her build squeeze and build community and build brand. She can build brand like no one I've ever met before. And then there's an amazing new Pilates concept called Scope that okay. I think is part of what I like to call the second wave of connected fitness. It's mm -hmm. probably going to be where the winners are. Mm -hmm. And I think her approach to connecting with consumers from a smart fitness, wellness, medical perspective is a little bit of a different take than I've seen before. And what's her name? Kim. Kim. So, yeah. Kim, Kim Majuri. Kim. Oh, okay. Got it. Kim Majuri. Awesome. So a recommended book or a podcast. Um, 
my favorite book of all time. Okay. It's Good to Great. Oof. Hell yeah. I read it about every year. I think Jim Collins. <laughs> the same, yeah. I, you know, chapter two, Confront the Brutal Facts. Like, every time I read it, I'm just like, fuck. Um, <laughs> sorry for the language on the podcast. Um, but I can't, I cannot recommend his book enough. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I'm a big fan of, of Brene Brown and all of her podcasts. So can't get enough of that. Got it. Helene, this was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful episode. I love being here and interviewing you and recording this. And I know that people who are listening, watching will be as well thrilled. Thank you so much for your time. And we are all blessed to have you here. Thanks for having me, Andre. Have a good one. Have a good one. And that's a wrap on another impactful episode of Muscle & Money. A big thank you to our guests for sharing their insights. To our listeners, thank you for joining us on the journey to build more successful gyms. Remember, today's insights are just the beginning. Apply what you learn and keep pushing boundaries. For more inspiring conversations and expert advice, subscribe to Muscle & Money on your favorite podcast platform. Leave us a review and share with fellow gym owners on the mission to elevate their business. Until next time, keep flexing those entrepreneurial muscles. Here's to your success in and out of the gym.